Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming uh, to the second lecture of my mini course on uh, Gaussian random fields in machine learning. Um, today's talk will be about predicting with Gaussian random fields and generating their sample path. And um, I want to remind you that on the previous lecture, I uh, gave some overview of uh, Gaussian processes, uh, Gaussian random fields in machine learning. Uh, I was primarily concentrating on their applications. So we didn't see any rigorous definitions or um, statements. And uh, a large part of today's talk will be devoted to uh, introducing Gaussian processes and the basic uh, formulas associated to the Gaussian process regression algorithm that we've seen yesterday uh, in, a, in a rigorous manner. Um, and uh, yeah, so let me start. Again, uh, I want to uh, invite you, if you have some question or comment, to interrupt me whenever uh, you feel so. and. Uh, ask your questions right away. So today's talk uh, will be divided in these four sections. Uh, first, we will talk about conditional distribution of a Gaussian random vector. So um, as you may remember from the yesterday's talk, uh, we were talking about Bayesian inference for Gaussian processes. And Bayesian inference is all about uh, computing conditional distributions. So in this first section, we will study the conditional distribution of a simpler object of a finite dimensional Gaussian vector. And uh, then we will use it um, to obtain some formulas for conditional distribution of uh, uh, Gaussian processes, which we are actually interested in. So, um, in the next section, uh, there will be given some example application of using this conditional distribution formulas for Gaussian vectors. Uh, it will be something called Bayesian linear regression. Um, and then in the section with number seven, we will talk about uh, how to lift uh, these conditioning formulas from Gaussian random vectors to Gaussian random fields, Gaussian processes. Uh, finally, in the last section for today, we will talk about algorithm sampling from uh, conditional Gaussian processes. So um, conditional distribution of Gaussian vector. As a foreword, I want to uh, stop a bit on this, uh, on the bias theorem which I talked a lot uh, about yesterday, but didn't uh, formulate it in any way. So um, in the previous talk, we talked about Gaussian processes in machine learning uh, as uh, something that could be used to do Bayesian inference uh, for functions. So Gaussian process is some prior on the space of functions. Then you can define some likelihood, combine it with some data and obtain through bias theorem uh, a posterior distribution over functions. Um, so let us here a look a bit about uh, on on the bias theorem uh, as it's uh, as it can be formulated rigorously. So for discrete random variables, theta capital and d capital. Uh, Bayes theorem is very simple and it says that uh, the posterior, which can be written like this, so it's a conditional probability of theta capital being equal to theta, uh, given d capital equal to d, is uh, uh, equal to this likelihood term, which is like this one, only the other way around, and uh, this prior term divided by some normalizing constant, which we don't care too much about. Um, 
it's a constant because it doesn't depend on theta. And as we are talking about distribution for theta, uh, it's, it's, it's a constant. Uh, so for uh, this is a very simple formula and actually it's deduced very simple in a very simple way from the definition of uh, conditional probability. Um, for absolutely continuous random variables, uh, theta and d, uh, Bayes' theorem uh, is much more complex because um, we are faced with this problem of conditioning on the event of probability zero. So we would like to condition on the event that D is equal, uh, is equal to some particular value. And uh, for absolutely continuous random variables, uh, the probability of such an event is always zero. So if we would like to use something like this, then we would have zero in this denominator and uh, every, everything would, uh, would not have worked. Um, despite this, there is a consistent way to talk about uh, uh, conditional distributions given uh, interesting events of uh, probability zero. And uh, this, uh, all, this all con is concerned with the theory of conditional expectation, which Kolmogorov uh, created for, for um, this thing to, to, to introduce this kind of uh, um, conditional distributions for, for zero measure, uh, zero probability events. Uh, not going into too much detail on this topic, I will just say that uh, with this, with a proper formal theory, we can prove a formula for conditional densities. So if theta and D are uh, absolutely continuous random variables, then they have some joint density and uh, uh, they have some conditional densities. And we can prove this uh, thing here that uh, a conditional density of theta given a particular value d of d uh, is equal to uh, this thing. So this is a conditional density again, d equal, uh, given theta uh, that what is called marginal density of theta divided by some uh, normalizing constant. Uh, here, a conditional density uh, P of theta given D is equal to this object here. Um, and uh, actually this is the important thing uh, that we can compute conditional density through joint density. When we know this, uh, we can plug in this formula and uh, this symmetric uh, variant of this formula into this one and see that it's trivially, it, it trivially holds. So apart from talking about uh, conditional uh, densities from this point of view, we can uh, talk about them uh, through this point of view just, uh, uh, and the, the difference is that is where we start. So here we start with joint density and here we start with the uh, density for theta and with likelihood of D equal uh, given theta. Uh, in theory, there is no difference between two, but in practice, the difference is uh, what is our like design of uh, um, model. What do we want to uh, assume for, for a known? Uh, joint distribution or, or these uh, prior and likelihood terms. Um, so Bayes' theorem um, is about conditional distributions. And um, mm, what I want to stress here is that it's not uh, too important how we get this conditional distribution, whether we use this formula or this formula, for instance. So basically we're interested in computing this, this thing. Um, although uh, this way is considered more Bayesian, it's uh, again, in theory, it's the same as using this way, just um, um, with slightly different um, 
way of representation our prior knowledge. So, yeah, so let us start with uh, finding uh, a conditional distribution for some for a Gaussian vector. Uh, this will have help, help great deal to find conditional distributions of uh, uh, Gaussian random fields later on. Maybe there are some questions to this point or comments. Okay. Uh, so let us consider a random vector, uh, which is divided in two parts. The random vector x. First part is x1, second part is x2. It's uh, distributed as a multivariate normal with mean, which is divided again in two vectors and uh, with covariance matrix, which is divided in four blocks like this. Um, if we denote by P uh, the matrix sigma inverse uh, inverted, um, then it's called the precision matrix. And uh, we can uh, write out the density of this distribution through this precision matrix. Uh, let us right away uh, denote its blocks similarly to how we denoted the blocks of matrix sigma. So with this notation, the uh, density of vector uh, x1, x2 uh, is uh, like this. So there is some constant. Uh, and then there is a matrix P uh, multiplied by this vector from right and from the left, the transposed copy of this vector. Um, so we want to compute what is the distribution, uh, what is the conditional density P x1 given x2. Um, Before we can compute this, uh, I want to uh, remind you of some linear algebra that we will need in, in this computation. So first of all, um, recall this uh, completing the square formula for numbers, uh, which you have probably used in, in school. Uh, if you have a polynomial of degree two, then it can be represented in this way. We complete the square and so here is the part that depends on x. Here is some constant and ash we can compute with this formula. Uh, the interesting thing uh, is that it holds also for uh, matrices. Uh, so in some sense, this is again a polynomial of degree two only here the coefficients are matrices and vectors. And uh, uh, this, the similar formula holds true that we can, uh, that this equals to this expression on the right where vector h can be computed and vector k can be, com can be computed through these explicit formulas. Um, and finally, I wanted to show you this scary formula. Um, you can, for, uh, for right now, you don't need to dig deep into what's written here, but the uh, main idea is that um, you can somehow invert a block matrix uh, by inverting and uh, multiplying its blocks uh, and some combinations of its blocks. So recall that we have this density and we want to compute this thing. Uh, we could have used uh, the Bayes theorem like this, or we could have used this uh, uh, conditional density formula. And actually this one is much uh, more convenient here for us because we know the joint density of x1, x2. That's what we started with. If we have started, uh, would have started with uh, this object, with defining this object and this object, then we would probably use this formula. 
but now we know this object, so we use this formula. Um, note that uh, this p of x2 is a constant. So knowing that this is a valid density, we don't actually know to keep track, uh, don't actually need to keep track of this constant. So what we uh, need to do here is to only keep track of the part that's de that depends on x1. Everything else is a constant and we know uh, this constant because uh, probability density should integrate to one. Um, so we can uh, write this uh, in the following way. Immediately put this constant into this C of X2. Um, and uh, uh, let us expand this uh, power of exponent just by doing uh, vector matrix multiplication. So for example, this first term is this multiplied by this multiplied by this. And uh, notice that uh, there is no uh, term corresponding to this multiplied by this multiplied by this because uh, simply because it doesn't depend on X1. So it's already in this constant C of X2. We are not interested in in keep keeping track of this term. So we get something like this. And then with uh, a simple rearrangement of what's happening there, there and with the uh, discarding of, for example, this multiplied by this multiplied by this, which doesn't depend on anything, um, we get this formula. And uh, this is uh, a quadratic polynomial like on the previous slide with matrix coefficients. So we can use uh, the formula from the uh, linear algebra part. And uh, in this formula, this matrix A will be matrix P11, uh, while this vector B will be this vector here multiplied by two. Uh, so we want to use this formula and also we want to immediately discard this K because again, it doesn't depend on X1. So it will be uh, sent into this constant. Uh, doing so we obtain this. So right here, A is P11. And then we have M1 hat, which is equal to again, A which is P11, uh, A11 minus uh, inverted. And then uh, this vector B, uh, which was divided by two. So this two and these two cancel out. Um, we are nearly finished. So we have this formula. And from this formula, it's already obvious that uh, the posterior density, the conditional density is, uh, it corresponds to a normal distribution. Uh, simply because it's part that depends on the variable is exactly um, some density of a normal distribution. Yes, some matrix and here we have some vector uh, X1 minus uh, the mean vector. And uh, knowing that the constant should be as it should be, we uh, immediately understand that this, uh, this is some normal distribution. Uh, what's left to do is uh, to write out this M1 hat and this P11 in some more explicit format. So to do this, we use uh, the block matrix inversion formula uh, to first understand this one. Uh, notice that P11 is exactly uh, this object here. And P12 is exactly this matrix here. So when we take this to the power minus one and multiply uh, by this, we are left only with B multiplied by T minus one and uh, with minus here. So 
in terms of our covariance matrix, it's uh, sigma one, two, sigma two, two, to the power of minus one. Um, from this uh, and from noticing that this P11 minus one, if this P11 cancel out, uh, we see that uh, M1 hat is equal to this matrix times this vector plus the M1 vector. And besides that, um, the matrix P11, which we have here, as we have already noticed, is this object. And uh, we have a formula for this M slash D. It's written right here. And uh, also it has some name, it, it's called sure complement uh, of matrix. Uh, I don't remember how to call this correctly. So it's, it's called just sure complement. Mm. Yeah, and uh, when we want to uh, know the covariance matrix of this uh, of this uh, normal distribution, we just have to take p11 to the power of minus one. So this power of minus one will disappear. Yeah, so the result is as follows: that uh, x1 given x2 is distributed according to some normal distribution, uh, whose mean is this and whose covariance matrix is this matrix. Um, maybe there are some questions on this computation. Okay. Um, so notice that uh, the conditional distribution is again Gaussian, as we have already mentioned. Its parameters are computable through simple linear algebra. So solving linear systems, uh, multiplying vectors by matrices. And also uh, notice that the variance is now lower in the sense that uh, vector x1 was distributed according to normal distribution with the covariance matrix sigma one one. But now the conditional distribution of x1 given x2 is this, uh, this thing. And it's actually uh, quite simple to show that this matrix is positive and this matrix is positive. Uh, so subtracting one from another gives a smaller matrix. This uh, corresponds to the intuition that when we condition on some data, we reduce uncertainty and we add some information about variable X1. Um, we could have started with uh, another perspective of this problem on this problem. Uh, as I have already mentioned, we could have really uh, explicitly given some prior distribution for x1 and some likelihood p of x2 given x1. And if we would do this in this way, so m1 sigma 1 1 here and this complex object here, which is actually what we have computed on the previous slide, just with the x2 substituted instead of x1 and vice versa then we would have uh, obtained the same result. Um, these two just um, determine the joint density. So it doesn't really matter what we uh, assume as known. It's just that uh, in this particular case, um, writing out the joint density was much simpler because this object is, is a, a complex one. But in many other scenarios, uh, this way of um, constructing a model uh, may be preferential because we may choose what this thing would be and we may choose it to be something simple and uh, meaningful. Yeah, so then to illustrate this, let us consider this uh, 
important example. Um, a priori, the, we assume that a priori, the, we think that uh, x1 is distributed as normal distribution with some zero mean and covariance matrix C. And what we observe uh, is a noisy version of x1. So it's uh, variable x2, which is equal, equal to x1, plus um, some uh, noise epsilon, which is uh, normally distributed with zero mean and uh, this um, sigma squared n times the identity covariance matrix, which is uh, independent of x1. Uh, in this setting, we get that uh, P of X2 given X1 is the normal distribution with mean X1 and covariance matrix like here, simply because uh, when we condition on X1, we can consider this right-hand side with X1 as some constant. And then we have normal distribution to which we add some constant. So this, this constant is added to the mean of this distribution. Um, so notice how this and this is much simpler than this, these two guys here. So this is a practical scenario where we want, may want to use the Bayesian formulation to, to prove the conditioning formula, which we have already proven. Um, but yes, yeah, so now we can uh, write out the conditional density using the formula uh, above. And uh, it will be this guy here. Um, to understand a bit what happens here, you, you may imagine that uh, sigma is equal to zero. And then here, we don't have this term, C and C minus one cancel out. Here we cancel out C and C minus one and then cancel out C minus C. And what we get actually is that uh, uh, P of X1 given X2 is equal to um, X2 deterministically with the zero variance. And um, this is something very natural because we observed uh, in this case where sigma is equal to zero, we observed the actual value of variable x1 here through observing x2. So the conditional distribution of x1 is just the value that we have observed. But if the noise value is not zero, then we have something uh, that is somewhat close to x2, but we still have some uncertainty associated to this. And we have something that's uh, close to x2 from one side and close to zero from uh, close to zero from other side because a priori we assume that x1 has this zero mean. This important example is actually um, useful for doing something that's called Bayesian linear regression, and. Uh, I want us to look right now at what happens with this. So first, let us recall what a simple regression, a simple linear regression is. Imagine that we are given some data, T1, Y1, and so on, Tn, Yn, where uh, each T is some vector and each Y is some number. For example, Y may be an apartment price and um, T1 may be, for example, um, apartment size, T2 may be floor height, height in apartment or something like this. Um, so the standard linear regression problem uh, is to find the linear model. So a function of this form um, that is to find some vector of vector uh, vector of weights uh, w 
such that uh, the, this error would be minimal. So the uh, mean square error between the our prediction f at the point ti and uh, yi would be minimal. And uh, so for a real, for some toy data, it may look like this. Uh, here with the right crosses, we have data. And here on the right, we have the same data and the linear model that we found optimizing this error through, for example, gradient descent. Um, so yeah, basically it's, it looks something like this. Now with Bayesian linear regression, uh, we use nearly the, the same model, but uh, we don't assume that W is now a vector, uh, just a vector of weights. We assume that this is a random vector of weights. And we uh, come up with some prior distribution for this vector. For example, something very simple like uh, uh, the standard normal distribution. Um, and then we may assume that uh, y at point t is equal to this f at point t plus some uh, noise term, where again epsilon uh, it's uh, some uh, identically distribution, independent normal noise. So the problem now is to find uh, the posterior distribution over these vectors W, uh, given the observations of this uh, random variable Y. It is rather easy to uh, see that both F and Y are Gaussian random variables. Um, well, F is Gaussian because the sum of Gaussians uh, is again a Gaussian and uh, Y is Gaussian for the same reason. And then we can compute the covariances between these uh, random variables. So for example, we can compute covariances between f of t and uh, f of t prime. Uh, so yeah, here I have a misprint. We have to have the prime here. Um, so we can compute this covariance uh, just by using the, line the linearity of uh, the covariance operator. Similarly, we can compute uh, covariances between y's and the covariances between f and y and uh, come up with a scary object like this. Um, so here we have a joint distribution for this vector and uh, its normal distribution which has uh, mm, zero mean and this covariance matrix. And this, cover this covariance matrix is just, uh, it's like this because of uh, the expressions above. We may denote it uh, again blockwise, uh, assuming that this is sigma one one, this is sigma one two, this big matrix is sigma two two. Uh, and similarly, we can uh, compute the joint distribution of vector of W and vector of Wise at, at data points, and uh, again do this block kind of decomposition. Um, maybe there are some questions. So um, then if we denote this um, by this bold y, the vector of y's, uh, we can compute the conditional distribution of the variable f at t, given this, uh, given the conditions that y at t1 
equals to y1 and so on. And we can compute the similar conditional distribution for vector w. Simply because they are jointly Gaussian, because we computed their covariance matrices on the previous slide, and we can use the formulas for conditioning of Gaussian random vectors uh, that we did use a couple of slides ago. So what we get here is this thing. And uh, what we see is that um, we can use this right-hand side to, as, as an answer to the linear regression problem in the sense that this is our prediction um, that we, pre uh, the value that we predict at, at the point T and it's dependent on T through this matrix sigma one, two. Um, and this thing is uh, the uncertainty associated to this prediction. Um, so this is some variance that we have. And uh, so, yeah, this formula is uh, actually more useful in practice than this one, this second one. Um, we then can draw this on, on a picture and get something like this. So it turns out that uh, the prediction is the same as for the standard linear regression, but also we have this shaded area here. Um, it's like the shaded area that I was using in the previous talk, but it's like drawn in a different, more fancy style. So the, the, um, um, the point is the same. It's, uh, here it's basically the visualization of the normal density uh, associated to each um, variable. So we have, we have normal density here and uh, the darker the blue color is, the larger the density is at the point. So uh, the great thing is that our model now knows how certain it is in its prediction. And actually it knows that it is not too certain about these predictions but because we see here that the straight line is not the best model. It's uh, the behavior that we would want from uh, this, this uh, bad linear model. <clears throat> One thing that we could have done also, and uh, which is really important in practice, is picking the prior and likelihood parameters. Um, so recall that uh, there we had this. So let me return to the, um, this slide. Here we had this uh, noise uh, parameter. And uh, to draw this picture, I actually assumed that uh, it, it's simply equal to one. But what we could have done is to try to pick the best value of this parameter. And uh, this is very simple to do. Um, to pick the best parameter, we write out this density uh, evaluated at the points, uh, at, the, at the data values. So y1 and so on, ym is y, our data. Um, we evaluate this normal um, density at this point. And we notice that it depends on parameter sigma square n. So we can consider this thing as a likelihood function and optimize it over this parameter sigma squared n. And uh, so it's easy to differentiate this function and to evaluate this function on a computer. So we can just run gradient descent, for example, to find the best parameter for sigma n. Um, in this context, uh, this uh, object depending on sigma squared or other parameters is called the marginal likelihood of the data that we observe. 
and uh, by optimizing the parameter, we get something like this. What we had before is this picture, and what we have after optimization is this picture. So actually, uh, the model decreased this noise, and um, it uh, and actually the noise here was really overestimated. It may not be too clearly visible on this couple of pictures, but uh, in uh, five or so slides, we will see that this transition is actually very important. Uh, and uh, this picture is much better than this one. Um, so that's all for conditioning Gaussian random vectors and uh, doing some stuff with them. Bayesian linear regression is actually uh, a powerful model, for instance, because you can uh, study not only some linear models, you can introduce uh, some coefficients that are associated to the, uh, for example, polynomial um, for some to some monomials or to some more complex, complete more complicated functions and um, use Bayesian linear regression to really solve some problems. Maybe there are some questions to this point. Okay, so can, can we use a Bayesian linear model as a particular example of the Gaussian process with some particular choice of, of mean and the variance? Yes, you can. Um, and actually, so we will talk a bit more about this in the next lecture, but um, yes, so it is a special case of a Gaussian process indeed. And, uh, with something that's called the linear kernel. Um, so I have a question in chat to explain the previous slide once again. Um, let me use my tablet here. I think I can just uh, write out what I mean. So we have this normal distribution and uh, its density is something like rho um, of, uh, and it's parameterized by sigma n squared. And uh, it can be evaluated at points, uh, I don't know, alpha one, alpha n. And it would be equal to some constant time, times exponent, times uh, alpha minus um, we don't need minus because this is up to zero here, alpha t, uh, this matrix say sigma n squared say sigma n squared minus one alpha um, and the, this constant is actually also dependent on sigma squared n. Uh, and we may consider this uh, not as a function of uh, these guys, but as a function of this guy. And for these guys, we can substitute here y1, yn here. And so then this function would show how probable in some rough sense, uh, the particular set of values y1 and so on yn is giving given this noise value sigma squared n. And again, if you look at the, how this matrix is constructed, you may see that when you write out the sum here, 
uh, you will have some closed form um, formula depending on this sigma, which you can evaluate for each sigma, which you can differentiate with respect to this sigma and which you can optimize with respect to this sigma. Um, and uh, what we, what I suggest to do here is to uh, do this optimization to find the best value of parameter sigma uh, for a particular data y1 and so on yn. Is it uh, better now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Let me clear this. Okay. So now we are ready to study Gaussian processes. Well, almost ready. Before that, let us let me define what is a stochastic process. What's uh, a sample path of this of a stochastic process, and what's uh, the distribution of a stochastic process? So, stochastic process is a family of random variables. As simple as that. It's indexed by some set T capital, which is just some set, and depending on what T actually is, uh, the stochastic process can be called uh, with different names. So for example, when T is some d-dimensional subset of RD, uh, it's usually called random field. And uh, when T is a subset of in integers, uh, it's called the random sequence. So for example, you may also consider uh, cases where T is a finite set then you would call this a random vector. Um, but it's kind of a, an abuse of notation. Nobody would call a random vector uh, a stochastic process. Well, usually nobody would. Um, the very important thing to understand is that xt, a random variables xt at different values of t may be dependent. And they, are, they usually are. So it's not just a set of different distributions at each point. It's um, uh, dependent random variables. And uh, this is important. So when we don't have dependence, we always have some noise. Dependence allows us to, for example, have um, these smooth samples that we will have. Uh, for Gaussian processes of interest. Um, there is an alternative definition of a random process as some random variables of some on some space of functions, but I will not uh, concentrate on this one. You can look up this one in, in books. Intuitively, these objects should be thought of as a random function of variable t. Note that uh, x can be considered as a real valued function of two arguments, omega and t, where omega is uh, an element of probability space and t is an element of t. And when we fix a particular value of omega and change t, we get some function of t and it's a deterministic function of t. This function is called a sample path or trajectory of random process x. So, and by fixing different values of omega, we uh, have different trajectories, different sample path of one, particular process. This is the, the, the definition of sample path. And uh, then uh, the system of distributions, uh, P of X, which is indexed by 
uh, number of points T1 and Tm, and which uh, is just a probability that this set of this random vector belongs to some Borel set A for all n and for all possible uh, values t1 and so on tn is called the distribution of random process. So basically the distribution of random process is uh, a system of distributions that you get by restricting this random process onto a finite set of values of t and considering their distributions. Now, a Gaussian process is a stochastic process for which every uh, such object, which is called a marginal distribution on this T1 and so on Tm. Uh, so a stochastic process is Gaussian if all these objects are multivariate Gaussian distributions. Uh, it is easy to see that the distribution of a Gaussian process is determined by a pair of functions, uh, by function m e e from t to r, the mean function, and by the covariance function also called kernel uh, k of t times t to r. Um, such that these functions determine normal distributions associated to this, this object. So uh, if we take a particular set T1, Tm, then the normal distribution here will be uh, this M evaluated at T1 and so on Tm, and the, uh, the function K evaluated in all pairs of points of T. So as a covariance matrix um, of, uh, of a Gaussian random vector uh, should, uh, should be positive definite, should be positive semi-definite. That is to satisfy this uh, symmetricity condition and uh, this condition that if you multiply it by some vector from right and from left, we would get non-negative number. Uh, we cannot, uh, um, allow here any function k, but only functions k for which uh, this would hold for all matrices of this kind. And there is a special term for such functions k. Um, these functions called, are called positive semi-definite functions. So that is for any n and for any set tn and so on tn, the covariance matrix like this should be positive semi-definite, then k is a positive semi-definite function. And uh, the interesting and also rather easy thing is that um, to every pair of mean function, which may be a completely arbitrary and to a positive definite positive semi-definite function k, there corresponds some Gaussian process having them as its mean and covariance functions. And uh, it follows easily uh, from the fact that um, such, such a couple of functions will uh, define a consistent in some sense family of distributions like this. And uh, then by applying the famous Kolmogorov extension theorem, which states that if we are, if we have some consistent uh, family of these objects, then there exists a random process that has uh, these objects as, a, as its marginal distributions. Um, so let us now define the conditional process. Consider some L-dimensional random vector Y and some value Y bold. Um, 
then we can define the conditional distribution of a process X given that Y is equal to Y both to be the family of distributions, uh, which is actually simply the family of conditional distributions. So for, for, for instance, if um, every uh, marginal distribution of process X was absolutely continuous, and uh, if Y is absolutely continuous, and then basically we would have that uh, um, marginal distribution of this conditional corresponding to these conditional distributions will be simply the conditional densities. So we condition the process by conditioning uh, its restrictions on uh, any finite number of points. And this is like a general philosophy. So uh, a process is determined by its behavior in a finite, in an arbitrary finite uh, set of points. So what we need to do in all the proofs and in all statements is to uh, check the finite dimensional result, but for all, uh, but for arbitrary choice of uh, uh, values T1 and so on Tn and for arbitrary choice of N also. Um, some questions maybe. Okay. Um, so consider some Gaussian process X and the uh, vector Y like this. So this is a vector of um, evaluations of the Gaussian process X plus some noise term. Then um, we can fix some natural number M. Oh, I'm sorry, here we should have L. Uh, we can fix some natural number L from uh, natural numbers and then some set, uh, some set like this and denoting um, the X of T tiled uh, like this. Uh, and also denoting the similar objects like this, defining the similar objects like this. So basically what we do here is we apply M to some vector, which we cannot do. Uh, so considering that T tailed bold is just a vector of all these T's, uh, but we just interpret, interpret this as uh, applying M to each element of uh, this vector T tailed and constructing the vector of this, uh, of the results. So it's done here, here, and here, the similar trick. Um, then by the conditioning formula for jointly Gaussian vectors, and we see that uh, a vector X of T tiled and vector Y is jointly Gaussian. Well, it's very simple because of this kind of formula. Um, we may compute the conditional density and uh, this would look like expression here. So as we had before, we have this uh, mean associated to uh, this vector, then we have our data minus uh, mean associated to uh, this vector here. And here we have this combination of covariance matrices and vectors and uh, inverting the matrices. This is just um, the same formula as we had on the previous slide. So uh, oh no, this is not the same, the same formula. It's um, 
that we see from the previous formula that uh, the conditional distribution is again Gaussian for each marginal distribution. And uh, we can compute its uh, parameters, its mean vector and its covariance matrix. And from this, we see that the conditional process is again Gaussian and we may compute its uh, mean function and covariance function. And uh, they would look like this. And uh, these are just um, um, simply deduced from the formulas that we had on the last slide. Um, so note that uh, the right hand sides here are determined by the, uh, we can say prior functions M and K and by parameter sigma squared N, which is an magnitude of the noise and by the data that we observed Y bold. Um, Oh, and it's also determined by um, location locations at where we observe this data y. So here should be also uh, by the set of points uh, t1 and so on tn. Uh, then we can observe that computation of these functions m hat and k hat can be done by a computer again because this is a simple linear algebra. And uh, all these matrices can be computed by evaluating these couple of functions and uh, using these guys here. Um, notice also that um, uh, if we define vector xt similarly to how we define vector x, xt tiled, as the evaluations in points ti, we have this formula for the covariance uh, between y and y. It's just the covariance between x and x plus this uh, diagonal matrix of noise. And uh, last of all, notice that here we also have this phenomenon of variance decreasing. Uh, for the same reason that we have for finite distributions, we have this positive function and we uh, subtract some positive number. And this all corresponds to the intuition that we gain some new information and the reduced uncertainty. So, and this is uh, uh, actually exactly the Bayesian inference for Gaussian processes that we have seen earlier in the yesterday's talk. So these are the same formulas only in a slightly in, sli in a slightly different terminology. Um, so through this cov operator, uh, I used different notation in the previous talk, but it's completely the same formulas. Um, so great, we we now know how these two can be inferred from theory. Uh, here I want to show you an example of a conditional Gaussian process. So um, as a small note, when I speak conditional Gaussian process, this is um, not something very well defined because what we actually have with uh, Gaussian processes or stochastic processes or even random variables that we only have conditional distributions. We don't have conditional random variables. But we usually, we usually say conditional random variable, uh, meaning just some uh, random variable that has distribution uh, that is a conditional distribution. So let us consider one of the most famous Gaussian processes, which is called the Brownian motion. Uh, it has its uh, set T equal to this half line. It has zero mean and covariance function, which is uh, this minimum here. Uh, denote this Gaussian process by X. And then we can consider another process, um, X conditioned 
on the on the observation that x at point one is equal to zero. Um, so this is the special case of what we have seen on the previous slide with the sigma, the noise parameter equal to zero. So we don't have noise here. We just condition on the value of the processor in a specific point. Uh, notice also how I use x evaluated at one, not x indexed by one here. Uh, so it's uh, more convenient to use this notation uh, and uh, I will, uh, in the following, I will probably use only this notation. Mm. In the definition, I needed to use the index notation because it's the way uh, Gaussian processes or stochastic processes are usually defined. But here, just for the sake of convenience. So here are two pictures. On the left, we have this Brownian motion. Uh, the intuition is that uh, it's uh, we, we have samples of Brownian motion, so we fix uh, some values of um, randomness, and we track uh, this x as a function of t. So with different uh, colors, there are different sample paths, and um, uh, we may see here that uh, they all start at zero. And then uh, to the point one, they all end up in different places. And also uh, you might notice that variance is getting larger as we approach one here. And this is quite clear because variance is just uh, this K evaluated at T, T. And uh, when T uh, is getting larger, then this minimum is getting larger and the variance is getting larger. But on the right, we have Brownian bridge. And here uh, you may notice that all the path, they come to the same point. At uh, location one, they all have value zero. That's why it's called bridge because it connects this point to this point. And also you may notice that uh, uh, from here to here, the variance is increasing, and from here to here, it's decreasing again. And uh, this Brownian bridge is just the conditional uh, process corresponding the, to conditional distribution of Brownian motion uh, when we fix the value in this point. So this is how this conditioning works. Um, any questions so far? Um, let us use now this conditioning technique uh, for the toy data set that we had uh, in the linear regression example. Um, consider another Gaussian process X for which uh, set T is just the real line. Uh, function M is uh, simply zero and uh, function K is given by this here. Uh, there was a question in the previous talk, um, in the yesterday's talk, what kernel was used in some of examples. And uh, I um, told you that uh, the kernel was like this. And actually, this is the most widely used kernel for uh, Gaussian process related methods. So it's no surprise. Um, and then we can uh, denote uh, by y of t i such random variables. So again, it's just uh, noisy versions of x at points t y. Um, here we have some parameters. We have this parameter sigma square here, l square here, and uh, sigma square n here. And for now, let's consider them just equal to one. 
then we can solve uh, the toy regression problem that we had by considering as the solution to this problem a conditional Gaussian process x uh, given the event that y at point t1 is equal to y1 and so on and um, that's what we have uh, with Bayesian linear regression we had this straight line feed, feed and here we had this uh, sign like feed which actually does much better job at um, approximating the data um, and so actually there was um, like zero model designing used to obtain this result and that's why it's so uh, uh, th this is the reason why it may be very convenient in some simple real world cases because uh, you just take some general purpose kernel like this one uh, you may even not optimize your parameters and then you construct your uh, construct your feed and uh, it looks okay uh, yeah and uh, the visualization here again is that uh, the bold blue curve is uh, conditional mean function m hat and uh, then here we have the visual visualization of the density function so it's just uh, visualize it visualizes how uncertain we are at uh, every point um yeah so and as we have done in the Bayesian linear regression example, we may actually want to pick the best values of parameters that we have. So yeah, we had parameters sigma and L in the kernel, in the covariance function, and uh, we had parameter sigma squared in likelihood. So it was in the noise assumption, but this noise assumption really introduces the likelihood in Bayesian terms, uh, as we have seen in this important example uh, in one of the first slides. So uh, basically what we're looking here at is uh, picking the prior parameters, because x is the prior, and uh, picking the likelihood parameters. And um, to find optimal values of these parameters, we do exactly the same. We construct this uh, the density of this random vector we evaluate this density at um, um, the actual observations that we have and consider it as function of these parameters then we optimize it over these parameters and uh, in this case we have something like uh, on these two pictures, so on the left what we have on the previous slide and on the right what we have when we optimize parameters. Uh, notice that uh, this is exactly the Gaussian process regression algorithm that I was describing in the uh, yesterday's talk. So uh, apart from calling access with the, the letter T, now we have completely the same pipe pipeline. We have some data. Then we come up with parametric families for mean function and covariance function. Then we use maximum likelihood estimation to pick the optimal parameters from data. Then we perform Bayesian inference with the prior with fixed parameters and fixed likelihood noise. And as a result, we obtain this m hat and k hat functions. Then we use um, this random variable, for instance, as some prognosis at new locations. So we draw with bold line this function, and we uh, form the shaded region around this bold line by evaluating this function. There was also this second use case which we will illustrate in the next couple of slides. So the first thing, uh, just returning 
um, just returning mean uh, function and um, shading some some region around it. Uh, this is called predicting, and this is good when we are interested uh, in knowing x t at new values of t. So uh, actually, when we are the, the the Gaussian process modeling is our final step of modeling, but usually it's just an intermediate step, and we actually are interested in knowing uh, what what does this look like. So we have some operator f, which uh, takes in the Gaussian process and returns some value. Um, for instance, it may be uh, I don't know, integral of, uh, again, some function or something like this. Mm, and when this operator is nonlinear, uh, we cannot just use the mean value of x here to compute the mean value of f here. And what we are usually interested in practice is uh, computing the mean value of the whole thing here. What we are forced to do is to sample x then apply this f sample wise and average to estimate the mean value and maybe to estimate uncertainty also uh, by just by analyzing the samples that we get. So in the pictures, uh, we can see that um, indeed this mean curve doesn't resemble very well uh, the actual samples of the posterior process that we have. So these are these correspond to the same process. Only on the left we have the visualization of prediction and on the right we have visualization of sampling. Um, now look at this. When we optimize uh, parameters as we have done on the previous slide, it was not completely clear from this picture of prediction that uh, something is um, way better now. But looking at samples, we can see that they do indeed uh, fit data, each particular sample much better than in the previous slide here. So first of all, um, this picture doesn't tell us the whole story about this picture. And second, optimizing hyperparameters is important. These are two main points. Um, and some maybe extreme case where samples uh, are very, very different from the mean function is for Brownian mo motion. If we consider the mean function of the posterior Brownian motion, then it will be just the linear interpolation between data points. So it looks like this uh, just pithwise uh, linear function, while samples are very uh, rapidly oscillating functions. These look nothing like this one. So um, it's kind of clear why uh, we cannot use, we cannot just instead of an ensemble of these ones simply use this. And uh, the one important example where it's indeed important is the guest statistical modeling, which we considered last time, um, where we have to uh, estimate what's happening between the wells underneath the surface of Earth. And uh, we have to uh, obtain some physical picture. Uh, then we have to use this picture as an input of some partial differential equation solving software. And in this case, this is uh, this operator F and it's non-linearly dependent on uh, a Gaussian process. So in this scenario, we're forced to sample our process, then do this uh, numerical solution of differential equations and then again empirically estimate the properties of the distribution that we have in the end. 
um, using the min function doesn't help much here. Um, yeah, so there is a question on how smoothness uh, depends on the kernel. Yeah, it depends. Um, well, it's not a trivial question on of what is smoothness. So first of all, there are several notions of smoothness for Gaussian processes. Uh, there are there is mean square smoothness, which is basically uh, the smoothness of the kernel function. And then we may want to measure the smoothness of actual sm sample part. And um, this is again some mm, um, subtle topic because, well, for instance, uh, we need to be careful with the uh, probability zero events. Um, well, for example, we can uh, have a stochastic process we can um, change value of sample path in one point to some arbitrary value. And this won't change the distribution that we have simply because this is some something of uh, probability zero. So um, what people do is talk about uh, modifications of random processes. Uh, and the question uh, that you might ask is uh, for which class of kernels uh, there exists a modification of a process so that its samples are smooth to some degree. And uh, this is a very interesting problem. There is a whole bunch of books devoted to this problem. Basically, uh, the simplest of um, the answers you can get here is that um, you can, fr from the mean square smoothness of the process that is from the smoothness of the kernel uh, you can usually deduce uh, some smoothness of sample path uh, not um, to the same degree of smoothness so for example if your kernel is twice differentiable then your samples uh, will probably be not twice but uh, less than a smaller number we will have smaller number of de derivatives. But uh, there are the results of this kind where we have, uh, we can transition the some statement about uh, kernel smoothness to the statement about sample smoothness. Losing something, but not losing way too much. Mm, yeah, so, and uh, for Brownian motion, we have uh, samples that are non-differentiable at all. And uh, for uh, this RBF kernel that we have seen here, we have infinitely smooth kernels, or so infinitely smooth uh, samples. So yeah, I hope I have answered this question and uh, we don't have much time left, so. Um, finally, we're, we have arrived at the last section of today's talk, and it will be a kind of small one. So first of all, predicting with Gaussian processes. And this is simple because we already know how to do this. We have these formulas uh, that we have already seen. And uh, uh, particularly for uh, some for a y, which is a noised version of x uh, with some normal noise. We have a simpler version of these formulas where we can uh, um, define the covariance matrix between uh, x at different points by this capital K with a couple of indices and write the same uh, in this but effectively, so uh, we know how to compute these two functions and uh, computing these two functions is actually uh, what can be called predicting with Gaussian processes uh, or rather even computing uh, this function and these functions when t 
t and t prime are equal to each other. Um, notice that uh, uh, the time complexity of prediction of computing these two functions is uh, O of uh, n to the third power, simply because we have this matrix inversion or linear system solution and it takes n cube operations to solve. And um, also we have space complexity here, uh, which is O of n squared, simply because we have to store this matrix, which is n by n. And so this is n squared complexity. Uh, this suggests that for uh, too much data, we cannot use this modeling. Well, for instance, uh, it's rather difficult to invert a matrix of size 10,000 by 10,000 um, for a matrix of size 100,000 by 100,000. You will probably not be able to do this on even a very powerful modern home computer, um, personal computer. Um, so there is some limit to what amount of data we can use when learning these Gaussian processes. Um, in most scenarios, this is not a big uh, problem because Gaussian processes are good uh, uh, with small data. Um, and this is actually the niche where they are most frequently used. But then there is, uh, there is a number of situations where uh, small data and large n are kind of appear in the same time because uh, you have sparse data. So you have data that's located uh, very sparsely around your space, but uh, you have abundant data in the some local neighborhood of some points. So in these cases, uh, uh, you may still want to use Gaussian processes, but uh, you are faced with the problem of uh, using this large number of data points. Uh, so then how can we sample a Gaussian process? Before this, let us, uh, let us learn how to sample a Gaussian vector. And it's done via this uh, Halecki decomposition. Uh, so consider a Gaussian vector X with some mean vector M and covariant sigma of size D. We can represent it in this form. So we just subtracted mean and then we took the square root of matrix sigma. And then it can be constructed like this deterministic function of noise variable epsilon. Um, it is something that is very simple to prove. Uh, the square root of matrix sigma one half uh, is uh, the matrix that satisfies this thing. There are many of them, but there is a kind of canonical algorithm that allows us to compute this matrix. And it's called Halecki decomposition. Uh, it, um, and it has complexity with respect to time of O d cube and with respect to space of O d square. Uh, so the naive algorithm to sample a Gaussian process will be like this. Uh, assume we have some process, then we can discretize our set T into some mesh of with the nodes T1 and so on TL. And then instantiate this a uh, finite Gaussian vector at this point and sample from this vector. And uh, so this costs O of L cubed time and O of L squared space. And uh, it uses samples on this grid or mesh of size L. And uh, this is actually a problem because this makes it impossible to use this algorithm in any high dimension. Well, because of uh, when you want a um, uh, rather fine grid in the in high dimension, then it's uh, the number of points it has is exponential 
uh, with respect to dimension. So for example, uh, the interval zero one, you can split in a hundred points and get uh, the kind of approximation of order 100. Then the square you will have to divide into uh, uh, 10,000 points. And then in the dimension D, you will have to uh, divide the uh, D-dimensional coupe into 100 in the power of D uh, number of points. And then you will have to cube this number of points and this becomes totally impossible. So yeah, mm, the question is, can we do better? And the answer is yes. And uh, that's what we will do in the next talk. There will be uh, uh, some approaches that allow us to sample and even predict faster than we have seen today. Um, and that are really important for practical use of Gaussian process metals, methods. So that's um, all for today. Thank you for your attentions. And uh, maybe there are some questions.